Matthew James Weagle is going to be our first reader tonight. Um, are you with us, Matthew? Yes, hello. Uh, he's, he's, he's in uh, Edmonton right now. Matthew is a Dene and Metis poet and artist pursuing an MA in English at the University of Alberta. He's the designer for uh, Moon Jelly House Press and his words and art have been published in various places, including Arc Poetry Magazine, Book Hug, The Polyglut and The Mamawi Project. Matthew is a National Magazine Award finalist, uh, Cecile E. McTaggart Award winner and winner of the 2020 Vallum Chapbook Award. His debut full length collection, White Mud Walking, it's a fantastic title by the way, is forthcoming in early 2022 with the venerable Coach House Books in Toronto. His chapbook, It Was Treaty, It Was Me, is available now. So over to you, Matthew. Hi there, thank you so much for having me. It's a, a real honor to be involved in this. And thank you to everyone here for, for being here and uh, those who, who work together to, to bring me to this event. Um, so first I thought I'd, I'd, I'd talk a little bit about what I do um, to sort of preface uh, the work. And I, I study treaty um, and British law required that indigenous title to the land be extinguished through something called treaty. Um, but here, treaty has a much more complex meaning about reciprocal relationships with the land and with each other. And I study treaty because my ancestors signed and negotiated in these agreements with the Crown. So the first poem is called Inside the Pop-Up Box. I'm in the library. Canada keeps my kin in. And I brought all of the other libraries that I've ever been in with me. My mom's library, where as a child, I saw a pop-up dinosaur and rows of shelving and drawers I thought must hold so many fossils. My dad's library of tapes in the car. My favorite songs are the ones that tell a story. And we drive all day my dad tells stories and I thought every story must be a layer in the earth of stories and I thought it's the stories in front of you that you remember the best and so this time I'm in a library and it's full of glass to let the sun in but all the books are in metal boxes in stacks in rows of other metal boxes all inside this concrete box. And the glass walls, they let the sun in and it's warm in there. I mean, I am warm, holding my coat and my sweater and my bag and all the other things that aren't my name. That I write on the clipboard. And it is not lost on me that I am here to see my grandfather's signature and that I must offer mine to the library first. In this library, they hold the layers of the thing called Canada. They keep it in a vault and behind it is another vault and across it is another row of vaults. And I can see the vaults, but I, I cannot see the vaults. Beyond us is the new building, the building they say that will be staffed by robots arms of a safer temperature, reminding us that to touch a document is to take a piece of it with you and to leave a piece of you behind. And it is in this exchange that we must climate control in a de-reciprocal programming. And when only the dead and programmed can see my kin, no one will see my kin. See me, my layers, a proclamation by the king with a line down its center. And this layer is the treaty, and this layer is the treaty, this layer is the treaty that cuts through the center of me. Whereas, in a line of red ink beneath, whereas in a red ink, her majesty, whereas I am a measure of a constitution, my kin and marked by hand, tooled in a border of fading gold foil, 
and with a spine that is no longer structural, but splayed propelle cutem on a table and numbered. Thank you. This poem is called The Geology of Colonialism or to expropriate from the British Museum's trustees, the Anthropocene is part of everyone's shared heritage and transcends cultural boundaries. The Anthropocene, the present catastrophe, made readable in future rock. This layer in the earth of nuclear waste, mistaken for a strip of what all humans wanted, a sediment of sharing, belonging to the world, to place power and plastic in the earth, to pry apart the timing points and layer them in parallel stacks, to time the earth and make lines of the land, to offer access to the future's past as a measurement of warning now and not as generations yet to be, but stacks of pages with gilt edges on the bookshelves of universities to pry apart the timing points and to label them, the mark of what is always to be present. And so it may be said this warming is no natural process, pulling apart the things that are with the economy from how things got this way with the land, as though this was not precisely the problem being faced. And so it may be said that this is each of us a personal responsibility as though we were not on that timeline now, as though the order of the system were not ordered, the disorder as though diffusion, whereby a room fills gradually with the scent of a dying thing, as though diffusion was of an order parallel with responsibility, as though dilution was of an order parallel with the ocean, as though the process of fossilization and the accumulation of mountains were of an order parallel with plastic and fission. The geology of colonialism is to pry apart the timing points that separate the atom into polymer lengths, settle in the earth, and claim it. Thank you. So uh, this story is called the prison warden bought my uncle's buffalo and sold them to Lord Strathcona. Until there were almost no buffalo left. They say the last buffalo to be born on the plain was in the care of my great uncle at Deer Lodge on the Assiniboine River. Policy and industry murdered the great herds and the land was changing. Trees were being planted. My great uncle would take home calves orphaned in the hunt. And when he died, the small herd was auctioned off to the prison warden, a Canadian soldier who came to the Northwest to kill Métis. And after, he settled in the Northwest. But the buffalo would not be kept in the prison for long. The warden owed Lord Strathcona money and sold the buffalo to him. And like all tycoons, Strathcona had no use for buffalo. And so he gave them to the National Park in the Rocky Mountains. The last buffalo to be born on the plain, they named Sir Donald after Lord Strathcona. And tourists came to take his photo. And when he died, the government took his head and stuffed it and hung it on the wall of the Banff superintendent's office. I am told that it may have been discarded after being eaten by the mice who took residence in the head. I love to talk about my family. Um, so does my dad. He tells lots of stories and I can see how much joy that it brings him to tell me about our family. And at Fort Providence, my great, great grandfather signed treaty number 11. And I found a photo of him and his family online one day I was really excited to share that photo with my dad. He's, he's so proud of the work that I'm doing. When I showed him the image, he got quiet, tears in his eyes and hands held to his face. You see, this photograph is not in the possession of my family, but it is in the archives of the University of Alberta. 
I've never seen the photo myself and neither has anyone in my family or my father. I found it archived online. The image has an item number, a subject taxonomy that links it to family and personal life and Aboriginal peoples. I assume it sits in a box on a shelf. We have some really good photos though. There's one of me on a, my, my auntie's uh, bare skin rug and my dad loves to tell that story because I didn't have a diaper on and he just laughs and laughs when he tells it. And you can imagine how much my aunt was freaking out. Uh, but these days I do a lot of work with Treaty as a scholar or a poet or whatever it is that I, I am exactly. These days I just have so many big questions um, about things like whatever Canada is or what Treaty is. And definitely one thing that keeps coming up is what is the company? And I guess in some ways it's easier to tackle these big questions than the more specific ones. Like I might ask, what is the company rather than asking who am I to the company? Who am I to the fur trade? Who is this naked baby on a bearskin rug surrounded by laughter and aunties? Who am I to a country in its infant nationalism? Something in a, in a checkbox, singular and compact, narrower than a column of how many beaver pelts were shipped away to England in a year. Who am I to that company of adventurers of England? So I check out the career section on hudsonsbay.com and it says, join us, your adventure. It starts here. HBC is a diversified retailer focused on driving the performance of high quality stores and their omni-channel platforms, unlocking the value of real estate holdings. We have a history of making history. HBC has been excelling for hundreds of years. We are proud of our significance. Our iconic blankets are the fabric of Canada, an unofficial symbol. We've grown and adapted for centuries, passionate, redefining, experience the opportunity of a limitless landscape. This poem is called Beonan. It is about Lieutenant Governor Alexander Morris, the commissioner for treaty number six. And he said, I will ask the interpreter to read to you what has been written. And before I go away, I will have a copy made to leave with the principal chiefs. Did you know where the river would take you when you first saw it? watched it bend toward you, wrap you up in school and bridges in a loop, watched it swim away even as it still holds you. Wait here. This is where we'll meet at Bayona. Did you know how much you would resemble an ocean? Gather everything who you are, wait and gather, wait and gather. These are things the river says here and speaks again downstream. Wait and gather, wait and gather, stories gather, witness gather, sharing. Touch the pencil, they say, make your mark, negotiate, agree. Did you know that when you wrote this down, the river would remember it. This next poem is called, We Drowned the Land of England in the Waters of Denente. It was clearly understood that there was no ownership of land, so clearly does the land in fact own me. 
my water from this river and my nitrogen a buffalo protein. I am a flesh-bound manuscript of what this place might say. Hearing it, how family signed the treaties. Live them, love the land, this place, this creek, this river. Make a sediment of me. Make mud, make silt, and send it on its way. Saskatchewan, Athabasca, slave, Mackenzie to the sea. And if you could take the dirt of England and rejuvenate the ground, if you could manage as was always managed, as people and the beavers manage, take the soil of England, cast it in the lakes across the north, and ball it up in handfuls, homes and dams, and hold the land of England to account for Canada, for the bishopry, for the company, and record it in the manuscript of the Northwest. And then write these things that we are saying down. Write them on two sheets, one for you and one for me to keep. And hold these things we learn and teach them on Tell the story written in the mud, recorded in the river, and copied days downstream. And then I would hope that you carry safe your copy. And when you find the sea, find England, compare it with this copy we have made, and stir the ocean with it. Eighteen seventy six. Treaty number six, I wake up at 6 a.m. to a weight on my chest and I massage it until it says the word treaty. 1876, and my uncle is at Bayonan, signs the treaty with a leftward slant. It is August and the aspens bend in the wind. I dreamt that I was in a library again, walking down the stairs into the basement walking down the stairs into the earth. I see the treaty parchment on a wooden table and it comes as no surprise that the land herself holds this knowledge. 1921, treaty number 11, my lungs are full of spruce trees. But otherwise I am empty, I am here to witness. 1921, and grandfather working for the company in Fort Providence. It is June, and that far north the sun would not set on the British Empire. He signs the treaty with a heavy ink. I dreamt I was a library again. It is an all or nothing calling. I have language for it. I have bones. But otherwise, I'm formless before the 7 a.m. alarm held loose on birdsong briefly between the low notes on their way to the water. I am bounded by the geese and punctuated by the dwindling of the caribou. I just have a few more. Um, this poem is called White Mud Walking. It's the title poem, a part of the title poem from my, my upcoming book uh, in spring of next year. Part two, I now cherish every attempt by a mosquito to bite me, understanding as I do that there are fewer insects every year than the last. And I wonder about 19th century anxieties of buffalo and I cherish the remaining buffalo and caribou and all the plant and animal nations not mentioned in the Treaty 6 document, but who are a part of the treaty nonetheless. On the boundaries of treaty number six, commencing to the place of beginning, emptying. In 1959, the South Saskatchewan River was dammed, forever altering the boundary of treaty number six, such that it technically no longer exists. The westerly to the western limit, thence due west, emptying to the source. It mu must also be noted that the treaty negotiations did not include any discussion of water or of mountains, precisely those features chosen by the Crown to mark the boundaries of treaty, making the boundaries a sort of negative space. 
to the Athabasca, the red deer, to the buffalo, Saskatchewan, beaver, up against the stream to the Green Lake and to the Rocky Mountains. The semicolon marks when a complete sentence is being added to, changed, emptying. Ecologists speak of metaphorical and dimensional objects that define our niche. Abstract objects defining our abstract place in ecological space, defined by what is around us. On a course northwest, northerly, northeasterly, easterly, southeasterly, south to the junction, the elbow, the head, the mouth, to the source and the place of the beginning, emptying. White Mud Walking Part 10. I think about what the phrase unspoiled nature might mean. I question this attitude of parallel existence, of people separated from the landscape <laughs> in unconverging lines of perpetually maintained distance. How this distance has caused so much pain. I think about how the connections between nations of people and nations of plants and nations of animals have been separated by artificial constructions of thought how these constructions are perpetuated by structures of living and structures of learning and structures of governance. And I think about how the land is living and learning and governance together. How this place beside the creek brings me such joy and knowledge and capacity that I am Dene and I remember the recording in the University of Alberta archives of my great grandfather saying, that the joy of today is not to be spoiled with the fear of tomorrow. Life is to be lived every moment to the full. And my last poem. 2020 witness continued. I dreamt that I was a river again. A thread of a glacier unwinding itself in slow motion, slow enough to dip hands in and drink. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Matthew. That's incredibly moving, fantastic work, superb. And I look forward to talking with you about it in a few moments. Um, Liz Howard is going to read next. And um, just a bit of background about Liz, her debut collection, Infinite Citizen of the Shaking Tent, won the 2016 Griffin Poetry Prize. It was also shortlisted for the 2015 Governor General's Award for Poetry and was named a Globe and Mail Top 100 book. Her second collection, Letters in a Bruised Cosmos, um, is set to come out uh, this year from McClelland and Stewart. Howard received an MFA in creative writing from the University of Guelph, and um, she is of mixed settler and Anishinaabe heritage. She's born and raised on Treaty 9 territory in Northern Ontario, and she currently lives in Toronto. So welcome, Liz. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you for that uh, lovely uh, introduction. Um, and I just want to say, Matthew, that was an absolutely fantastic reading. Um, such a pleasure to hear you read. And that there's something that uh, I wrote down from your reading that really resonated me, which was to touch a document is to take a piece of it with you. And I believe um, at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, was there not a, um, a display of the original treaty? Six that was signed. Um, um, actually, yeah, the kind of there's we have um, a parchment copy. copy. Yeah, yeah, one of the one of the the, the printed copies of, of the document that was meant to be delivered to this to all the signatories. Uh -huh. um, but in almost all cases, these copies were actually not delivered to the signatories. Uh, um, I see. And it's, it's seeing that document for the first time that really two years ago that that really yeah. just set me off on this on this course. Yeah, remarkable, wonderful. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for that. It really sort of reminds me of um, 
you know, Walter Benjamin's notion of like the, the aura around an, uh, an artwork, around like the specific instantiation of something physical and, you know, to touch something to be tactile um, with a document that, that has, has had such and will have so much, so many ramifications for one's own particularity, um, right? in space is, uh, is pretty thank wild. You so thank you so much thank for that. Thank you. Um, and thank you, um, thank you, uh, Peter and Michael and David for um, having me here today and facilitating this, uh, this digital um, interaction that we are uh, a part of now. And I'd like to thank also uh, Derek uh, Bouillot from the Banff Center um, also in, in Alberta, who I believe put my name forward for this. Um, and uh, I'll read a few poems for you. Um, I'm going to read a section from my first book, uh, Infinite Citizen of the Shaking Tent, called Of Hereafter Song, which is a, a sort of writing through or against um, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's 1855 um, quote, 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 unquote, North American epic, the song of uh, Hiawatha, that um, really misappropriates, misattributes um, the oral history of the Southern uh, Anishinaabe of the Great Lakes um, to a historical Haudenosaunee figure um, named uh, Hiawatha. Um, and all of the content of this poem was based on very spurious research conducted by uh, Henry Schoolcraft, uh, an early um, ethnologist or anthropologist in the, uh, in the U.S. And he sort of assimilated a lot of these a lot of this oral history into this really sort of janky, um, trochaic uh, tetrameter that was borrowed from um, uh, a Finnish epic. And by the end of this poem, it details you know the life, uh, the life, the the birth, life, and times of of uh, quote unquote Hiawatha, who is um, really a, a stand-in for. Anishinaabe culture hero, uh, uh, Nanabosho, who um, is of, um, you know, uh, heavenly and human origins. Uh, so it's, he's been written up before as a kind of, uh, almost like a Christ-like sort of figure. Um, in any case, this poem sets up um, his death as um, paving the way for the acceptance of um, missionaries um, into the community and sort of sets up this uh, narrative of manifest destiny. So I've taken the text from this poem and, uh, you know, sampled it, rearranged it, and also interweaved text from my own, um, my own personal uh, journals uh, going back many years, um, text from ecological uh, reports on the impact of um, industrialization and otherwise, you know, um, you, you know, usage of land and waters in the Great Lakes region, uh, the consequences of that and also um, language from reports on the effects of um, residential school system, um, generally, you know, institutionalization um, of indigenous people and also uh, reports on missing and murdered indigenous women. So this is the background for this set of poems. Contact. We rested back onto the lakes and marshes, into the light dialysis of heron and arrowy swallow, 
with all the trees of silver tongue gently from the melting lakes and streamlets into the sweet radiation of the earliest flower in the northland intolerable toward the red stone the stem a reed into the puffed metastatic coal became the water into the affirmative action embryonic mortality of the loon summit robin gazed into the bigger than the big sea water bioaccumulation became us sweet reconciliation spoke in mercury arsenic lead and cadmium along the physiognomy of the amphibian by which we descended the women of fishermen looked over tailing ponds like a cloud rack of a tempest rushed the pale canoes of wings and thunder to kill the wilderness in the child sweeping westward our remnants sulfur infinite sorrow extracted tuberculosis under the jurisdiction of ravens in the covert of pine trees or an education by thieves in the evening a rude inscription at the top of heaven hushed all the falls of pulp and paper graveyard invertebrates wheresoever the new famine wars went before any thunder contagion muted us in the temperature dependent marshlands that opened all tributaries of reddened mercury when those lilies fell me not a human heart near shore the minimum criteria an uninterrupted silence laid against the fields the fields laid against said dna along the marginal pause a disparity of garments trimmed the skin to a threat of arrest above the overcrowded fog with mosses dioxin so lovely i forgot who i was tender pathos a denser blue vapor fresh and simple any possible lake could tell a bushwhack savior loons likely moved to crown land a place time would inscribe as cloudless in the rear window of no fiscal return last june in heaven tailwaters did valley the hydro atmospheric adverse emergency shelters of children taken on advisory boil this water of false men electric among haunts of new aquatic species as i heard them in autumn before the prairie also hoof prints half effaced spread as legs in the corn groping lifted up my lodges my beaver my own face in the meantime dredging every wetland for a starry green and silent recreational home bigger than level spread the lake my bosom and its shadow exaltation lifted my liquid features from the corroded mist i have as much at stake in speaking this as the water which also discloses futurity in a little black dress for all history awaited you was open to you bade you entrance to an unequivocal buffet of redacted mischief we're just friends hanging out in my apartment until the world ends and now that the world has ended and we have not ascended into heaven here comes the future let it in let it in and let our consumptive prom begin and i'm just going to read a, a couple or a few uh, poems for my for my new book 
Letters in a Bruised Cosmos, which, um, which goes on sale on the 8th. Very, uh, very exciting. And this, this book is a little uh, more personal um, in stretches than, than, my, than my first, than my previous book. And uh, I, don't, I, I don't really want to give too much of a preamble, so I'm just going to launch right into it. Settler. Anishinaabekwe, Noli Tubare. Beauty is my irreparable eye, and today I became geometric. A faux linear figure that distills the skipped trace of first principles. In a whiteout of Atlantic snow, banging stars into the femoral vein of Euclid, while rows of lavender circuits, all porous, surrounded me. A genuflected before the hospital parking lot of my father's jaundice. For I am a good daughter of the colony, the colony which begot, the immortal heart of the markets, a liquidity it should service. I'm sorry. Re, I'm sorry. The colony which begot, the immortal heart of the markets. Resources nursed all young bucks of the florets, a liquidity I should service or else receive a lesser dessert. With my smudge cleanse at the ready, I find myself dispensing with the usual future haunt of resilience, a survival signaling my relationship to time or my out of it entirely. Come polygon and I circumvent the disaster. Do not disturb my circles. Holy I went, holy all around my head. The holy I am went careening down the back stairs of this low rise rental, striated by the pinnacle light of this city that has my blood pooled purple at the center of its gravity. You can scan the ground from overhead for death pits. I read this on the internet when I was dehydrated, lonely, and freed. Office plants became the broad-leaved repositories for my cognition's faded heart. I've gone and been abominable. A column extended from the top of my head into heaven. At the edges of my system, an Anishinaabeg or Indo-European projection of words my nerves could translate into the crawl space of animal magnetism. White pine verticals send us up as a stomach pumped by filial love. Oh, inconsequent curb of my street, I refuse to kneel this day like any other. Plush pockets of rust about another falsehood of water, a creek that cleats. I've gone and got a blister that summer. A black bear's muzzle got, got coated in shellac from the aerosol can she bit through on my mother's porch at the edge of the forest. Four generations ago, my great grandmother said, don't ever shoot a black bear. They are my people. Makwa, Makwa from the North Shore. Before I continue to speak more than this, mortuary sunrise where I am only just alive. Uju, I mean, hello, today is over. And I'll read one final poem, and then I believe there'll be time for discussion and q and if you have any questions. I believe you're invited to pop them into the appropriate chat or Q&A, please. And this is a um, letter from Halifax. I just walked the street of my father. The street is called North. I paused in front of his white apartment building as the sun fed me from the west. 
There were two shop shopping carts chained together, one from the liquor store. My father turned empty bottles into full ones, into food and into rent. He pushed his cart across the city, gathering emptiness. I wonder if the North was the repository for his best intentions. He left when I was an infant. Powerless over drink, he ran, jumped the track, and erased himself from public record. He became a shadow I couldn't match. Every native man on the street, the unidentified dead in government databases, I searched their faces to see if they were a part of me. Would be astronomer in his youth, I learned also to try and cast my gaze upwards. When I look at the Pleiades, I see seven sisters who could hold me. In Anishinaabe cosmology, the constellation is known as Begonagishig, the hole in the sky, a portal between this world and spirit, where I go when I dream, and if anywhere the place, I'll find him again. I'm trying to write this as I sit in a Tim Hortons, waiting to meet his common-law spouse, who will give me some of his personal effects. When a man next to me asks, what does this word mean? Pointing to a spot on the page of the Maclean's where the word rapport appears. I landed yesterday in Halifax. My aunt had called to say he was here in hospital with liver failure and in a coma. The doctors would give him 48 hours to come out of it. I had the thought, maybe, if I go to him, he'll wake up. My father's skin had yellowed, and the sclerae of his eyes, which were half open but clouded, a tear slid from the corner of his right eye to pass the bone of his indigenous cheek. This tear had not yet dried when they began to withdraw life support, machine by machine. What kept him breathing? What jerked his head back and expanded his chest with decreasing regularity was the last to be withdrawn. A nurse said, he is in the process of actively dying now. Actively dying. In the ancient Near East, a seer would look to the stars or the livers of sheep for divination. What does a liver show or hold? Spirina, the Horospex, foresaw the death of Caesar and the entrails of a sacrifice. Pagak, the cursed Anishinaabe skeleton who flies through the boreal forest, is said to consume the livers of his victims. Prometheus's punishment for stealing fire from the gods was to be chained to a rock and have his liver torn out daily by an eagle. Every night, his liver would regenerate. Two days have now passed. Two days I have been in Halifax. Two days since my father has passed from mystery into appearance laying bare his totality on a deathbed, distended cirrhotic belly and a thoroughly beautiful face. He passed from unknowing into eternity as I watched the neon lines above him lie flat. I am still watching. I still do not know what I know. A nor'easter now passing over me, spilling its moisture from the Atlantic. Heavy rain that by midnight may turn to snow. What does it mean to actively die? Actively. I've been reading Knausgaard, who writes, quote, for life, um, quote, for the heart, life is simple. It beats for as long as it can, then it stops, unquote. Full stop as in a period, 
as a period, as a flat line when extended. I have been given my father's papers, his Polaroids, and a pocket watch that belonged to my great grandfather. I have been keeping, I'm sorry, I have been given his ball cap that kept the maritime sun out of his eyes as he scavenged for bottles. The band of this hat has collected his scent, which is lemongrass, earth, and discount smoke. I have been given his small tools, cologne, nail clippers, a water canister, a small plastic box of razors, a picture of me as a baby, a drawing of electrical currents, a knife. I'm here wedged within three nor'easters. The first fell after he died. The jaundice, the eyes that are mine, the snow a white out of every street. The third will come Tuesday and cover Halifax in a foot of lace. Today I bought Ocean by Sugoya, a black dress and a pair of tights. Today I ate berries and drank black coffee. Today I felt the harbor folding in. A sphere flinched in my portal vein. Today I woke up late. This evening I looked up at the counts of looked up at the constellation, Orion, Babuni, Kionini, the winter maker. Tomorrow I will see my father's body for the last time. Tuesday he will become ash, become ash actively. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much for that, Liz. That was incredibly I don't know, terrific, very musical, just full of ideas and super intelligent. What a great reading. Really, really terrific. I'm sure, I'm sure if- Thank if, you very much. Thanks. I'm sure if everyone wasn't muted, you'd hear large rounds of applause, really. So um, uh, what I'm gonna do is, I, there are a few questions coming in. I'm gonna just start with one that's a general question for both of you, really, if that's all right. Um, because one thing I really noticed in this in this work, and I've noticed in in, in your work previously, is this uh, use of source source material, especially in the earlier work for you, Liz. Not so much in this recent book, at least as as the, the pieces you've read. I have I don't know that one yet. Um, but Matthew, with the with the um, you know all the treaties, obviously most obviously, but also the section on the HBC Company. There's a real engagement with the source material and then Liz with, with look, re writing through uh, Longfellow. And I just wondered what your thoughts are on, on you know, how important is that to, to go back to source material? Uh, will, is that something you're gonna continue doing as you go forward? How crucial is that to your own poetics? That's a do question for, I, both, for both of you. Do you mind if I go first, Michael? I'm gonna start with my screen. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Matthew, Matthew, sorry. Um, yes. So yeah, I've been working slowly with this text, uh, the song of um, Hiawatha by Longfellow for a number of years. And for my next book, I'm hoping to continue working through that. Uh, that text in a, in a different sort of way. I'm interested in the history of this, of the reach of this poem, because it was at the time, I guess in the, the, mid, the mid to late, late 1800s, it was the most popular piece of literature in North America. Not, not even poetry, but just proper. And it very much, you know, set the stage and set this mentality as, um, as like what is indigenous is something that's already in retreat. It's already something that's past. Um, it's already something sort of like very sort of, you know, something to be reflected upon and wandered at. Something sort of like, um, yeah, in in retreat, very bucolic, very. Um, much a sort of consideration of um, the quote unquote like like noble noble savage who um, who is no more right um, 
now we all have to sort of, uh, you know, now that it's sort of the uh, colonialist uh, project is to, uh, if not, if, if one is not, you know, able to, you know, exterminate a people outright, um, how do we go about, you know, assimilating them um, to, to our way of life? And, um, you know, and, and, and sep in, in, a, in an effort to, you know, separate pe these peoples from the lands of which we've already signed treaties with them, right? Mm. Because if there are no longer any, any more indigenous people or, or, or Indians, there's no, then there's no claim to Indian land, right? And then um, all those titles would be, uh, divert back, I suppose, to uh, the, cra the crown or be bought out or so on or so, so on and so forth. Thank you. Uh, so I, I'm interested, yeah, so I'm interested in uh, what part politically, um, socially, this, um, this poem had an impact in, um, in, the, in, in the minds, in the, yeah, in the everyday minds of people, sorry, yeah. Sorry. I mean, it's likely still a holdover in the kind of popular Disneyfied imagination on some. Yeah. Level. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. That's yeah. Very interesting. Um, Matthew, do you want to respond to that question also? Yeah, definitely. I, but I want to say thank you, Liz, so much. It's always a pleasure to hear you read. I'm such a big fan of your of your work, and I, I know that that I'm really looking forward to your new book coming out for sure. Um, the the tendency to kind of build off of what Liz said, there's this real tendency in the colonial project to historicize things and to to make them a thing of the past and this contained singular event that is no longer sort of attached or or component or you know part of of, of what we're experiencing today. And so that that's a, a big a big move that that happens a lot. Um, and so part of my work. Um, I'm starting my PhD in the fall. I'm doing my MA now, so a lot of my work is 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 very much about. Um, I mean, in, to to put it bluntly, is an excavation of of, of genocide is an ongoing process. Um, this is not a thing that that is over by any stretch of the imagination. And so, to to bring these documents or these stories um, out of the archive which in some cases are literally buried in, in the ground um, for safekeeping. Um, that's, that's kind of the, the, the main um, goal is, is to, to, to reiterate and revitalize and, and, and tell these stories and share these stories because they are, treaty is a, is a living document, is a living process, is a living agreement. Um, it's not something that was signed once and then, and then it's over. Like it's, it's, it's forever. Okay. That's a very important work, I think, that you, you're involved with. Very, very, very important. Um, I have about, like, loads of other questions, but I think I'm going to go to the chat because I want to, you know, I'm aware there's other people here. Uh, um, uh, let's see. Linda Hagerstone says, Matthew, your stories and poems are terribly moving far beyond the power that the written word alone can impart. Is there a way to receive your telling of these unique and important pieces? Is there a way to receive them? Uh, um, I, I don't know. I've, I've, I've thought about like recording or, or doing an album. Uh, sometimes I've, I've, I've done a couple, like I did a radio thing once um, pre-recorded. Um, I think that that's a good project for the future. Um, but for the most part, I would say that, that they are at the, at this moment limited to, to my chapbook, uh, which you can get. Um, and a lot of my work is actually visual um, or design based. So there's a lot of visual art and visual poetry that, um, you know, is, is, is obviously even more difficult to convey in, 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 in speaking or, or performing. So a lot of that is, is best looked at on the page, um, which again, you can, you can find some of that in my, in my, in my chapbook and then my my book when it when it comes out uh, soon. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, yeah, that that interface between the visual arts and and writing, I think, is pretty significant for your work, isn't it? 
Yeah. Um, Chris Goodkind, who also is a Canadian poet living in London, I know, uh, he says to ask uh, him, I suppose that's Matthew, something about the precision of fact and feeling in your poetry and how it's related to going forward. Precision of fact. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't know if Chris can, can clarify that question a little more. Perhaps it's also relevant to Liz though, so. Yeah, I don't know, did Liz, do you, do you want to, to, to speak to that? I can, I can jump on it too, but go for it. What is the, I'm sorry, what is the inquiry, like precision of I, I think it's about like precision of fact. And, and feeling, it looks precision like. Precision of fact, I guess, as it relates to feeling in the poetry. I know, I would uh, say that. Do you want me to say something? Or, can you hear me? Oh. Oh. oh, Chris, yes. Oh. Okay, yeah, well, um, that's actually... Very cute, that's a very cute avatar you have. Is that a seahorse? It, actually, it's, um, it's called an hairy ghost pipe fish. Very rare. Beautiful. Beautiful. Anyway, it's it. sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, well, I actually, the question really was for both of you. I put a further question in the chat saying to ask you as well, which was this thing about, it seems like there's... Um, a usage of very precise, whether archival or historic things, combined with you know precise encounters in the present, with those or with other realities. And I just was wondering about the use or why you use precision, uh, how it, how it's important to you. That's about it. Well, I, I do you mind if I go? Can I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for All it. Right. I think that this is a very um, um, great question. <laughs> Sorry, my vocabulary is feeling me in this moment. Uh, because I believe that it is in search of a kind of precision that I even started writing poetry in the first place. Um, I very early on felt um, compelled by, by science and like a scientific method and very sort of an, in an orderly or like an, 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 or an, an, an exacting way of using language. Because I feel that, you know, my, there is so much going on in my mind at any given moment. It's like there is about like 15 different radio stations or something going on in my head. Uh, and, and anything that I do, I have to work so hard to focus um, my, my attentions and en energies toward any one thing. And for me, Poetry allows a kind of paradoxical precision in its, you know, in, you know, indeterminacy. There's a big part about poetry that is relatively indeterminate. That is a lot about like how um, the reader experiences it, you know, like within, within their own body, within their own uh, frames of reference, within their own experiences. Um, so I found a kind of precision through poetry to rend to try and render as much uh, as possible as my own uh, of my own understanding and experience um, of the world within uh, you know within within language within a received you know language like English which is uh, which which is not you know the lang you know the language that my that um, you know, some, some of my family spoke only a few generations ago. Um, so it's a, it's a complicated uh, precision. Can I, I, can I jump in here, Liz? Because yeah. I think that, you know, some of the diction you use, some of the language you use is drawn from science, but there's okay. also poems that use untranslated words from yes. Anishinaabe yes. and then colloquial English words all together and untranslated. And yet there's a, there's an overall sense of musicality that, kind of unifies yes. the whole thing no yeah. matter how disjunctive it gets yeah i mean that seems like a very precise uh, yes awareness I, of thank you <laughs> you put it much better than 
right? Then I can. But that's exactly that's exactly it because I uh, for for myself a lot of this is like as much as my my subject matter may, may be difficult. Really, what this is is um, um, is a gesture towards like a connection, and it's something like born out of like a desire uh, for connection, for intimacy, and for pleasure. And for me, like poetry that is most like pleasurable for me is it is is one that is like more is most kind of connected to song right mm -hmm. to song and and breath work um and so like yeah no matter how kind of you know sort of you know wide-reaching or kind of nonsensical my poetry gets there's always that sense that it that it's coming through uh, you know like a pulsating breathing body right yeah that comes across towards, towards really another of the same. That comes across very clearly. I think Matthew, your your poetry tends to be more kind of narrative and story based, and perhaps the precision is in the way that you're telling a story rather than a more kind of somewhat lyrical subjectivity or so, or present presentation in 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 uh, in Liz's poems. Do you, do you, what do you think? Yeah, I think I think story is really important, and I think they. Um, I, I also have a, like a science background, and so. That's something that's that's been really, really for, uh, at the forefront of just sort of like the way I approach some of the work that I do, um, just because it's that that research mentality which is like translated into into the, the the work that I'm doing now, and I think when it comes to narrative, like you know, all of these things are, are are connected through story in a lot of ways, and just how you how you move in the world you know and, and all of those all of all of that is this complicated thing that you kind of have to if you're gonna tell a story or share a story you know you have to kind of utilize the, the tools that you have which in some cases is a science or or for me in a lot of ways is like a like my my visual poetry or visual art it has a lot of i'm always spending way too much time in design just trying to make things like exactly the way that i want them to look and that's a, a real challenge um but when it comes to poetry you know i i cut my teeth definitely in in spoken word open mic kind of spaces and so that's where i i feel the most comfortable i would say um it, because doing that work on the computer and and putting all these pieces together can be really exhausting and, and you don't get that feedback mm. of community or or the the audience that, that you would get if you were if you're performing on stage or if you're you're in a group of, with a group of folks um, experiencing poetry and stories like that so when it comes to precision i think that it's extremely useful in certain situations but um at the end of the day i think that it's it's just one of the sort of like to one of the tools in the in in the toolbox, you know, to to get those stories across. Okay, That's I don't know if that answers any of the question, but I love pipefish, so well, I'm. Well, I think it, I think it does. <laughs> I think it certainly addresses the question. No question about it. Yeah, um, I'm just looking in the chat again. I'm not sure how much time we have left, Michael. Do you do you know how how much time we have left, or can we? I'm gonna kick us out. <laughs> uh, the, the, in theory, it's entirely up to you, um, but I would say, you know, maybe another five. An another five minutes or so? Okay. Um, there's a question from Linda Hagerstone, and she talks about the, uh, having memorized the Song of Hiawatha. She's also a poet. Um, and she says, what would, speaking to Liz, what would you suggest as a way to change this type of ingrained emotional understanding of misappropriated stories? Brackets, of course, your own poem has helped a little. So I, I think it's a question about the politics of the work. Yeah, really. well, I suppose, you know, perhaps, you know, my role as a poet is, you know, to bring awareness um, in an interesting way to a small subset of people, I suppose, who are interested in poetry. Mm -hmm. And in poetry that isn't, you know, sort of um, um, written in the form of like, you know, sort of like small daily affirmations or, you know, 
furious poetry you know, kind of read for you know sort of pleasure necessarily yeah but um uh, yeah I, I mean this is this is the sort of work that i'm that i that i'm hoping to do and i'm gearing up um to do to do it you know i just finished this last book uh just a couple of months ago um, mm -hmm. so i'm working towards this other one how I mean, I think that the best way anyone right now could do to um, work against some of the work against kind of like, you know, received misappropriated um, ideas of indigeneity would be to, to read other um, indigenous authors, mm. and especially, you know, and, and poets. And, especially like um like indigenous women and two-spirit people who, who are always very much underrepresented and i feel sometimes get uh, a lot less uh, respect um, than men do um so that would be my my recommendation read more good good idea <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we all need it um a few weeks ago uh, Joy Harjo, the American Poet Laureate, spoke and read in this series. I don't know if you managed to attend that or not, but she did talk about her poetry as a kind of healing ceremony and a sacred ritual, which really also had a political dimension to it at the same time. It didn't, you know, and I wonder if this is something, a component that either of you see in your work at all, um, this, this type of uh, you know, ritualistic component. Uh, you mentioned wilderness quite a lot and you mentioned, you know, um, a kind of wider space than just an individual focus. Um, so I just w wondered about your thoughts on that. I guess maybe that's probably the last question we'll have time for, but there's no other ones in the, in the queue and other than, than many people saying thank you. So that's probably the, the question we can, we can end. And Don, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I have a, a response to that for sure. Um, place is incredibly important. Important. Um, I'm very, very fortunate to live where I do, um, where my ancestors have always lived. Um, I have got ancestors everywhere, but here especially, um, I live this street outside my window is you might have seen me gesturing in this direction. That is the, the, the river um, very near to me. And so this, this street right here is actually, it's called the Old Fort Hill Road. Um, and that is a, a path down to the river to Beonan, which I, I, I mentioned in reference in, in, in some of my work. And that is a, a, a trail that is thousands of years old that my ancestors would have used to go down to the river to a place where they would wait to, to be able to, to, to cross. And then on the other side of that river is, is where Fort Edmonton um, was uh, located. And so there's, there's a, a very strong connection to the, the place I, I literally am right now. And of course, smack dab in the middle of that trail is the, the CPR uh, rail track, which also figures highly in my work in a lot of ways. Um, so it, it, I would say when it comes to the, the, those, those connections, um, it's very much, it's about the land and that's, that's like the, the, the bedrock, that's the, the foundation of, of everything and just kind of it being present and, and, you know, being, moving in that, that fortune, fortunate space, being able to be here and do the work that I do. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, um, Matthew. Um, and just I, and, and just quickly, I suppose my answer to that question would be, you know, as regards um, our idea, as regards the writing as a kind of a healing, healing ceremony or something that could be ritualistic. Um, I, I grew up uh, completely, I completely disconnected um, from my from my, my my the native side of my family, my father, my father and, and his family. And I found that when I started to write about more personal things, 
um, like when I was a child, I wrote about like foxes and black bears and snowflakes and things like that. And pro probably around puberty, uh, things started to get a little more st uh, stormy and personal and kind of bordering on goth, <laughs> very emotional. Uh, but I found myself a writing, writing out of um, this uh, absence and silence from my father and my father's family. And um, I was raised, you know, I was raised with the knowledge that I was, um, that, I, that I was Native and my mother did her best to um, foster a kind of, you know, um, pride and participation in that part of uh, my uh, identity as, as much as she could. But I felt like it was very much through poetry that I was doing this. I would almost like write poems as almost kind of like incantations or messages or letters like to my to my grandmother to my father and then um year, years later you know um when i was working on my first book i i started re, you know researching um anishinaabe cosmology and ways of knowing and uh, rit ritual practice um to counteract you know i have an undergraduate uh, degree in uh, psychological science uh, but I wanted to see, um, learn more about um, other ways of, a, of, a, of obtaining knowledge. And I came across uh, and read extensively about this one ceremony called the the, uh, the uh, Jisakuen or the uh, Shaking Tent Ceremony, which is almost like a sort of a form of, um, I, I don't know, sort of divination. There is a tent that's specially constructed um, for a, a tent operator to enter and receive information from um, corporeal entities, spirit entities that usually have um, and uh, are affiliated with a certain animal group. Um, and in these ceremonies, information could be obtained about gen like general, generally the future. Uh, where best to go and hunt. Um, if you wanted to inquire about the health of a relative that lives some distance away, um, you could obtain, you know, in, information um, in this sort of way. Um, in the settler literature, it's sort of been described as a as a sort of a quote unquote like Indian oracle. So it's a sort of uh, oracular practice, and I came to feel a kindred sense between what I was doing in my creative writing practice as what um, some of my ancestors um, that I've been able to actually find records of um, their accounts and witnessing of, cer of ceremony like this um, were doing. Uh, so poetry is sort of is a way for me to be, be connected with ceremony in the limited way that I am able to. Wow, okay, thank you. That, that actually makes a lot of sense, both of what you both said. It really kind of clarifies things. So thank you very much. I'm just going to say thanks again to both readers for splendid readings, very moving, wonderful. And also thanks again to Derek Beaulieu in Banff and to uh, Michael and David here in England.